second reading this morning comes to us from Luke's Gospel in the sixth chapter, beginning at verse 17 and continuing through verse 26. Listen for God's word to you this morning. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you. And when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man, rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This past week, In her midweek musings email, Lynn Hinton, the executive director of the New Mexico Conference of Churches, wrote about the art of blessing. In it, she observed the varied times, places, people, and things she'd been asked to bless as a pastor. Everything from a child's skinned knee to a particularly zealous parishioner's NASCAR hat. She goes on to note that the dictionary definition, or dictionary defines blessing as an expression of good wishes or a special favor granted by God. Blessing, writes Lynn, calls attention to that which is wonderful. That's certainly something the world could use more of. There's no doubt that given all the pain and difficulty we've been through these past couple of years, we could stand to have our attention drawn to all there is around us on a daily basis to fill us with wonder. There are all the obvious things like the the blessing of a good laugh, a, a decent cup of coffee, a chat with a friend, heck, indoor plumbing. But when it comes to blessing, Jesus doesn't confine the realm of God's favor to simply the things that we find wonderful. And that's our habit, isn't it? The writer Kate Bowler notes that Instagram is filled with examples that chronicle what we think is our best lives. Taking the kids to Disneyland. Surfing in New Zealand again. Does it ever get old? Happy anniversary, honey. You're my best friend, my soulmate, my everything. All with the hashtag blessed. But in this morning's reading, In what I like to think of as the unvarnished Beatitudes recorded by Luke, Jesus challenges our assumptions of what God favors by naming as blessed the very things we try so desperately to avoid. You don't see too many Instagram posts of the poor with the hashtag blessed. Pictures of the hungry don't tend to trend on social media as blessed. 
We don't make a habit of pointing to grief and loss as a source of God's favor. And hatred, defamation, and exclusion that can be attributed to one's faith are more often than not a badge of victimhood than they are signs of blessing. So what gives? Why does Jesus say that those who experience poverty, hunger, grief, per and persecution are blessed? Because to our ears, that doesn't sound like anyone's best life. That sounds like someone who might want to examine their life choices. The truth is that Jesus, in the Jesus that Luke shows us acts and sounds different in his preaching than the Jesus whose Sermon on the Mount in Matthew is far better known. When it comes time for Matthew's Jesus to preach, he goes up. The mountain where he sits above them before he begins with the better known beatitudes. But Luke's Jesus came down with them, we're told. Standing with them on a level place. And these two trajectories carry into the words each version speaks. The beatitudes that we hear in Matthew are elevated. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. These are spiritualized, these blessings. But in today's reading, the blessings Jesus names are far more grounded, far more earthbound. It is the poor, period who find God's favor, those who are bereft of material wealth. It is the hungry, those without enough food to eat. It's no wonder that Matthew's version is the better known of the two. We're far more comfortable with those beatitudes since they don't tend to challenge the material comforts that we so enjoy. Which makes it all the more important that we stop to take stock of the radical prospect of a divine blessing that threatens to turn how we think about God's favor upside down. Perhaps one of the smallest differences between these two accounts points to one of the most significant things to take away from this version of events. In Matthew, when the disciples come to him, Jesus just starts talking to them. In Luke, however, Maybe you noticed that before Jesus says anything, he looks up at them. For Luke's Jesus, it's less important that he sits somewhere that the people can see him when he talks. Rather, what's most important is that they know he sees them. That's the very first thing, by the way, that God tells Moses on that holy ground where the bush burns and is not consumed, God tells Moses he has seen the misery of God's people in Egypt. In the same way, this detail about Jesus looking at them, accompanied by these words of blessing, assures the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the reviled of the earth that God sees their misery too. That while their struggles might get overlooked by the rest of the world, they do not get overlooked by God. In fact, it is to such as these that the present realm of God's power and love belong. It belongs to those to whom nothing else does. It is the home for those who have nowhere to go, nothing else to cling to. And it has to be said that what Jesus offered is not a cliched version of, it may be Friday, but hang on, baby, because Sunday's coming. This is not pie in the sky in the great by and by, that convenient and ultimately hollow bromide offered so easily by those with plenty who preach patience to those without to try to make their misery more palatable. Sure, things are bad now, but don't worry. When you die and go to heaven, everything will be great. 
The blessing Jesus offers, the favor of God, is not some deferred annuity whose benefit only accrues to some indefinite future destination. It is for those who are poor now. It's for those who are hungry now, those whose tears have not yet dried, and those who are systematically shut out of the places in this world that are reserved for the like-minded. Jesus has no time to waste on later. The favor of God rests upon those who need it most. Those who need it now. St. Therese of Lisieux was a Carmelite nun of the late 19th century who was known as the Little Flower. She was a young French woman with little formal education who nevertheless was named as a doctor of the church by Pope John Paul II for the depth of her theological wisdom and understanding. And one of the things that she taught was that of all the sciences, there was only one that God did not know. Arithmetic. Perhaps that's the best way to understand the difference between the way we talk about blessing and the way Jesus talks about blessing. Because we talk about counting our blessings. But Jesus knows that the only blessing that matters, the only blessing that makes a true difference in our lives, comes when we stop counting. Stop counting our sins and stop counting our virtues. That's why Jesus doesn't stop at naming the blessed. He also catalogs the corresponding woes that are corollary to those blessings. They are a warning to the self-satisfied who often excel at counting. Woe to the rich who take consolation in their wealth. Woe to the full who live to eat and do not know what it means to have to eat to live. Woe to those who act as if life's a joke without understanding how precious life becomes when it's lost or taken away. Woe to those who count their likes their good reviews, their accolades and affirmations as a measure of their own worth. Woe to those who count their blessings as a reflection of their own goodness, evidence of their favor with God, because God's favor cannot be counted. It simply is. The only way to fully receive it is to empty our hands, our hearts, and our lives. And everything else we're tempted to hold on to to give them meaning. Because none of those, th those things that we're holding on to last. As another Teresa, this one of Avila puts it, all things are passing. Only God is unchanging. The poor, the hungry, the grieving, and the despised are not blessed because those things are particularly blessed. Poverty, hunger, grief, and being hated, these are not conditions to aspire to. Such as these are blessed because they have had the false promises made by the things of this world stripped away and can see that such things are always passing. Those who experience them find themselves in a position of complete and utter dependence on the only one who is unchanging. These are the things that force our hands open to receive the blessing to be found in each moment. Likewise, wealth, plenty, laughter, and the good opinion of others, these aren't necessarily bad things in and of themselves, but each of them holds the trap of enticing us to trust in what can never save us. 
there is not enough material wealth in the world to save any one of us. We can have our fill to eat, but just get hungry again. Our laughter may succeed in hiding our loss, but we'll never escape it. And adoration generally persists only as long as we say the things that people want to hear instead of telling them the truth. To entrust our lives to any of these things is to lose the plot by seeking the favor of everything but God. The blessing Jesus names does indeed call our attention to that which is wonderful. What is good news, really? What is wonderful is the promise of the God who is present to us in every moment, who indeed sees not just what we in the world thinks are blessed, but who sees us through it all. What is wonderful is that the favor of God does not depend on what we think is blessed. Rather, when we find ourselves depending solely on God's favor, God's steadfast love that endures to get forever, we find that we are, in fact, blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. As you stand as together we say what we believe using the words of affirmation in your worship order from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen.